And for a lot of course books, pronunciation does get missed off because it's so hard with all the countries around the world to know exactly what your students are going to struggle with. You know, someone speaking English in South America is going to be very different from someone speaking English in Asia. So that's why I think that teachers need to know and understand this FUMP idea so that anything missing, you're going to cover the base. And it is, there's no point in teaching grammar without covering pronunciation, okay? So you've got to learn to love that pronunciation. Don't be scared of it. It's a good stir activity that you can do. And so make sure that you do cover that pronunciation part, okay? So course books are not always 100% perfect, but they're very, very good for what we need. And I think tweaking is okay. You know, your course book has a, a fantastic base and gives you loads of ideas, but the course book has no idea of knowing what your students are like, their profiles, their needs, the next zone of proximal development. So uh, I think that to go through and have a look at activities and move them around might be a good thing for your classes. So let's have a look at this one. So um, this is now the present continuous questions and short answers. This is the next part of the book. We've got our grammar table. Okay, we then move on to complete questions by ourselves. Again, it's that first layer, can we get that structure correct? And then the next one is, again, the student's head down in the notebook. So at the moment, we've got a lot of settle, settle, settle. Depending on the dynamic of your class, you might want to just tweak that and make perhaps a settle into a stir. Let's carry on. We now have um, heads up and we're doing pronunciation. That's great, of adjectives. And then again, pronunciation over here. I've had to cut and paste the pages of the books. So that's why that's jumping around a little bit. Sorry for that. Uh, so we've got stir, stir, a double pronunciation practice. And then again, we're playing with a friend and another play with a friend. So you've technically got settle, settle, settle. Stir, 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 stir. Okay, so I think looking at your, your book and saying, okay, great, my kids are gonna love that, that it's building them up to, to speaking about something, great. Your class, you might think, okay, I need a stir, uh, settle halfway through all those stirs, okay? So tweaking the course book is absolutely fine. Go right ahead, take ownership of your class. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the section where I'm just going to talk about some practical ideas that I do in my class that you can use in your classes. So at the beginning of the year, you might be in what we call lockstep. So this idea of lockstep is where everybody is there together, doing exactly the same activity at the same time and then waiting for everybody in the class to finish as well and then perhaps the teacher will give feedback and give answers, okay? And I think that that's fine at the beginning of the year when you don't know your students, you don't know what they're capable of, and you also need an element of control in your classes. But I think then good scaffolding would be to let that go a little bit and to let your students be a little bit more autonomous, okay? Rather than waiting, because if someone finishes fast, then they'll be waiting for a slower one. And if a slower one feels that everybody's finished before them, they're going to feel that pressure of not performing well. And so we want to let go of that a little bit. And also in the first few weeks when you're doing this concept of lockstep, like I say, that's a great idea because you're noticing your students. You're noticing who finishes fast and correctly, mostly. Who's finishing fast but is a bit sloppy, hasn't edited their work, hasn't quite got the right answers because they just want to race through it. Who's taking their time but getting it right? Who is um, a bit slower and still getting some things wrong? And who is perhaps completely lost? So it was all different types of profiles in your class. So lockstep can work, but then once you've identified your learners, I would then perhaps think about putting them into grammar table groups. OK, so ones that are working pretty quickly and correctly can sit together or in two separate groups, but they're you know, the same sort of level. Um, the middling ones, the ones that need a lot of help. Um, groups are good for grammar, but I would say perhaps don't put groups together all the time so that they're not working with anybody else throughout the whole year. Um, it's really good when our students get to mingle and talk to other people, but perhaps for a grammar-based lesson, perhaps we can have our table groups. 
And I'm also a fan of not calling table groups one, two, three or four, A, B, C or D. There's sort of, it denotes a kind of ranking. Um, so I tend to use, I don't know, colors or, or, or group names. So put them into, put the students into groups, table groups of like, uh, like-minded, like level groups, similar levels. And why not tailor the activities just for that group? Okay, and what you can do is you can produce an instruction sheet for each table and the table has to work together in order to achieve the things on that instruction sheet. And so you are carefully selecting the scaffolding tasks that you think will work best for that particular table group, okay? Because we need to be looking at that next zone of learning and it might be that there are some students don't need such basic gap fill uh, grammar things because they've got it and they've got the concepts they can move on to that next level but there are some that might need that gap fill uh, exercise so produce an instruction sheet and then also you can um, nominate roles for the students um, teens like to be uh, in control uh, treated like adults but with an element of fun of course and <laughs> um, they like their silliness but they also like to be trusted so I like to give them roles so first of all um, someone is the team captain they're in charge of making sure all their team are working correctly and that they're also keeping an eye on the time, okay, if they've got a time limit to complete tasks. The secretary is the person who, as they're collaboratively working on something, the secretary will write down the first answer, but then encourage everybody else to write the answer in their own books. The editor checks everybody's work to make sure there's no mistakes. And the teacher liaison role is for when you're walking around the classroom and guiding and supporting. The teacher liaison student is the person that communicates with you. So if you're checking in on them, they have to communicate how well they're doing. If they have any questions, it's the student who's the teacher liaison who talks to you or raises their hand or comes and gets you. Let's look at one of these instruction sheets then. Here we go. So at the top, I've got Team tra. So um, for me, I like team names, but sometimes with teenagers, they can spend about five minutes debating what on earth their team name is and sometimes fall out about it. So I tend to put down two letters to start with to limit their choice. So here they could be team truthful, for example, and then space for them to write their role names. OK, captain, secretary, editor and teacher liaison. Now, those roles are not exhaustive. You can give other roles uh, as well, but these are the ones that I use. And so the instruction sheet here is, your mission is to work together to complete as many activities on this list as possible. You have 35 minutes. So this sheet has been designed for my middle students who were, who were pretty good, but perhaps not the most outstanding in the class. And so um, we've had a look at the grammar together. We've done the, the listening. We've done our grammar table, perhaps. And then I think my students should do activity one and two from the book because it would be good for them for their building and leveling up. I'm then going to challenge them. They're going to create their own grammar table. And I've got this as an act. I'm going to explain this a bit more coming up uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, the next thing is they're going to secretly draw a room in their house and they have to describe it to their friends. Can they draw a picture? So it, imagine this lesson is on prepositions of place, directions, and also vocabulary. This is great, it's communicative, it's fun. And then finally, they're going to design a dream room and they have a budget. And they should uh, do this in 35 minutes. Then in the next class, I'll be doing something with that dream room. I'll be doing a communicative activity with that. So it is OK as well to break down grammar lessons into multiple different lessons as well and getting students to do work that then gets uh, put on to the next uh, class because we don't want our students to feel under pressure uh, at the end of the class as time is running out to do that very important project. It's okay to spread it out over some classes. So this is an, an idea of one instruction sheet. Perhaps for my uh, lower level tables, the teachers, or I am there guiding them a little bit more and just making sure that they've, they're doing that lower level scaffolding. In my higher groups, they don't need perhaps those gap fills. Um, they can go on to producing and sharing things with their friends. Okay, so it's that idea of differentiation. One thing you might want to do is to give a larger time limit to do more than one task. This helps you get away from that lockstep idea 
Okay, so everybody, there are six activities on in the book and you have um, 20 minutes, half an hour to do as many of those things as you can. Good luck. And the students can be working together with their partner to try it and um, solve any doubts that they might have. And then also you can give answers in different ways. You don't always need to stop the class and say, okay, everybody, what was the answer to one? What was the answer to two? What was the answer to three? It can be more dynamic than that. You might want to project the answers on the board for the students to correct themselves. Um, one team can write it up for you. You can place a handout, a photocopy of the teacher's book, for example, that gives the answers. Um, if your teacher's book comes with um, resources, multimedia resources and interactive smart board technology, web-based things, they, they have the answers uh, like GoGetter does. It can project those answers up for you. And I think also allow for creativity. You know, you might have, like in that instruction sheet, I had uh, create a dream uh, house or create a dream room. You might have students going, oh, I don't want to do that. That's boring. OK, well, give me an alternative. What do you want to produce? OK, and if you can justify that it's going to produce the language, great, go ahead. You want to write a rap song? Go for it. You want to write a Twitter conversation? Do it. It doesn't matter. Get them in involved with creativity. Praise any independent thinking that they're doing. As I mentioned before, putting a name on the board helps guide the ship. It no, you, your class knows exactly what they're doing today and what they're expected to do and should be able to then walk out of the classroom going, oh yeah, okay, no, I've got, I've got the idea of that. Okay, good. They might need more consolidation, but they've got that general gist of that grammar. And I think that putting the aim on the board is great, but you can jazz it up a little bit. You can make it more fun. I put gaps in my aim. So for example, at the beginning of the school year, I will put the aim. So students get used to the fact that they know uh, what's expected of them in class. Example in blue here, today we will learn how to say what is happening now. This is called the present continuous. Okay, but in future classes, I leave gaps. So here we've got today we, W-L, how to, mm -mm, what we, mm. okay. If you always use the same first structure, today we will learn how to, then that's nice and easy for the students. They've also got that structure locked in their brain for probably for the rest of their lives. They'll remember that well into their uh, retirement years. Uh, and then the other parts, hmm, a little bit more tricky. What are we doing today, teacher? And so suddenly students are quite uh, engaged in that lesson aim. What is that missing word? Can I show off? Can I get it? Can I get, can I guess the word for a point? And so uh, here the missing word would be describe what we uh, look like. And if your students are struggling and they're, and it's also really nice because my students tend to generate multiple words that begin with D and L, so they're activating that vocabulary, which is lovely. Um, and if they're struggling, I then put the next letter. For example, I'll go D, D, E, get them to guess a bit more, D, E, S, and then so, someone will say the word, okay? So this is a nice way to get students' attention almost immediately in the class as they're sitting down. Okay, so at the beginning we talked about this idea of building on foundations and one scaffolding way to do this is to activate prior knowledge. And that is when you get a text, a listening or a reading, and you're asking the students to pull out of their brains what they already know about a said topic and or placing the students sort of in the context of everything. So here we've got, uh, from the book, we've got a text on exploring the Himalayas to go find a Yeti. If you're lucky enough to have technology in your classroom, you can get your students to use their phone or the school iPad, put them into different groups and say, right, okay, where are the Himalayas? Tell, tell us an interesting fact about them. Go, you've got three minutes to find this. And each group will probably come up with a very different, interesting fact, what they find interesting. And then they can uh, tell the other people in their group and share that knowledge. And they're going to be researching in English, of course, and encountering that vocabulary that might then come up in the listening. The other group, what's a Yeti? Can you tell us an interesting fact? If you don't have access to technology, that's fine. You're just going to need to use, you know, pictures, realia, maps in this case. You know, you can give each group a map. It could be a photocopy map, something that you've printed from the internet, or a real map if you have one. Who's the first team that can find the Himalayas? Great. Now, what can we notice? Do you think it's going to be hot or cold there? What other countries are around it? 
And so you're putting the students into the context, activating that imagination, getting them ready for the task. And they probably, as we've said before, have some kind of foundation knowledge about this already. So we're just waking that up. So typical scaffolding there. You might want to activate vocabulary. Uh, because you know, for example, if we're studying animals, there might be some animals coming up in the text and you want your students to remember that. Well, what I like to do is I like to take a, a piece of paper, uh, A3, and then I fold it into four spaces and then I unfold it. So it's automatically been divided. And then um, I put the titles at the top, as you can see here, can find in a zoo is in one quadrant. Are typically pets is in another quadrant and so on. You give each paper to a group and then you say, okay, everybody in the group, there's one person writing, but you're all brainstorming. I would like everybody in the group to fill in the first column, which is animals you can find in the zoo. You have one minute, go. And the students work together to remember how to spell, how to, uh, how to write those different animals that they're thinking of. And then after a minute, I then say, okay, stop. And then each paper gets passed along to the next group. And then the group takes their neighbor's piece of paper. And I say, okay, everybody, I'm gonna do uh, column two, off we go. And then we continue to pass the pieces of paper around. And so why is this fun and effective? Well, it's this idea of scaffolding where it doesn't necessarily have to come from you. With each new piece of paper that the students get, they're getting the ideas from a different group. So if they've just filled in the animals they can find in a zoo, then they get another piece of paper, they can check and see, oh yeah, we wrote that, we wrote that. Oh, well, we didn't write that animal, what's that animal? Then at the end of the lesson, you can clear up those doubts or ask the students to explain to each other, what is that animal? What special vocabulary did they write? So when they get their original piece of paper back, they can be studying it and they, can, they have technically taught each other. So this is another way in which scaffolding can work that doesn't necessarily have to come from you. Also, it's quite nice because, because you're planning and you've planned the lesson, you know what animals are coming up in the lesson. And it's also nice to perhaps have a look and see on your piece of paper, oh yeah, no, that group got that animal and it's difficult. And so we definitely need to, as a class, use that animal and explain what that animal is because it's gonna come up in the, in the text. So that's also really, really nice if you keep an eye on what's being written. Um, this idea about pre-teaching essential vocabulary, yes, that's uh, tried and tested, it's very good. Uh, for example, here we have um, uh, a text about sailing and the book has uh, very helpfully highlighted in yellow the words that um, your students might find tricky or that, that they really need to know what these words are in order not to be blocked to understand the text. And of course, the typical way of matching vocabulary is to put the vocabulary on a piece of paper on the left column and then on the right column you have the definition and then maybe students are drawing a line and trying to find it out and that's that sort of um, settle dynamic head down and concentrating perhaps they then might check with a partner or ask with a partner um, but I like to flip that a little bit and I like to have it in a more communicative way so I'm just going to share with you my my favorite way of pre-teaching grammar yeah, sorry, vocabulary, um, which is uh, have a piece of paper, um, write the word that you need on the back of that piece of paper, write the definition, okay? And um, make sure that there's enough pieces of paper that each student's going to have one. Doesn't matter if you duplicate the paper, there might be more than one student that has the voyage uh, word. Um, and then I ask students to mingle, and then what they'll do is they'll stand up, they have their piece of paper. They go to their partner and they say, um, do you know the meaning of voyage? And the person, if they do, they'll explain it to their partner. And if they don't, their partner teaches them. And then vice versa. Their partner has the word sail. So do you know the meaning of sail? And if they don't, they teach their partner. And when that has finished, they then swap pieces of paper, they have a new word and they go off and they find another student to teach. And after about five minutes, the students have seen every word, uh, defined it, and also um, tested their friends and taught their friends how to say these words. And this really helps uh, a grammar reading or a grammar listening 
so that we're not blocking our students from understanding the grammar that they're going to extract from the context. This is a nice way to have a communicative way of doing a, a vocabulary pre-teaching mingle. Rather than pre-teaching vocabulary, you can point out root words, prefixes and suffixes. So again, it's this grammar style way of teaching vocabulary, but also asking your students to be a bit autonomous. So imagine we have this phrase here, unknowingly, he had left the window undone. Oh, so we've got a couple of un-un prefixes. It can be quite tricky. So instead of teaching my students the meaning of unknowingly or undone, I'll give them a real life skill. And I'll say, okay, class, before we read, uh, let's just check our meaning. What's the meaning of unfriendly? Okay, and then they tell me not friendly. Good, what's the meaning of unfinished? Not finished, because they've heard these words before, they've encountered these words before. So that when they, then I'll say, okay, you might need to think about that prefix, that little UN as you're reading this text. And then it gives them that skill that will help them in exams or help them in any kind of future situation where they don't know um, uh, the, the word that they need. It's uh, getting them to analyze it at a more grammatical level. So I talked about this in the instructions for students, table instructions. It's the idea of creating their own grammar tables. Now, I, I think grammar tables are really nice and clear, but the one thing they're not is they're not personalized. And we know that students, uh, when things are personalized for them, they're more likely to remember it. And so I like to do this idea of making our own grammar table in our notebooks and asking the class to generate funny sentences, sentences about each other, about uh, their, their friends, their family, themselves, um, whatever they think they want to do, as long as it isn't offensive um, or rude about a, a student in their class. But as long as it's fun and funky, they're more likely to remember it. And as long as they're getting that form through, then they, I don't mind the verbs that they're using. Okay, so it's more, uh, more memorable. And of course, this is one way of moving away from that teacher talk time, where the teacher's standing there and presenting that grammar. Instead, we're collaborat <laughs> collaboratively working on uh, building a grammar table together and uh, students putting it into their own notebooks. And so, yes, practical scaffolding ideas. Um, as we know, we've got the, the layers of the gap fill, yep, to start with. And this is an example of a gap fill here from the, from the course book and the answers there. Um, practicing our present continuous affirmative. Um, there are absolutely fine gap fills, but again, if you feel the need to swap the idea of settle into stir, maybe you're going to ask, uh, maybe you're going to cut up, you type out the sentences and then you cut them up and then put all the pieces of paper into um, a clip uh, and then give the clip to the pairs or groups and they have to work together to construct the sentence correctly. So students are really noticing uh, subject, verb, object, and so on. Maybe students are creating their own gap fill sentences. This is for to push uh, perhaps more advanced or higher level students. You know, they might think, oh, this, this is easy, I know this. Ah, but it's quite another thing to write your own gap fill sentences and swap it with a partner so you can level up. Uh, or maybe to make it easier for your students who find this quite difficult. Uh, a, a layer before this one might be to have the words in a jumbled order and the students have to see which one um, uh, goes first or in it also a semi jumbled order as well for those that really struggle you can have like pairs of words that go together and now let's look at um, scaffolding ideas for when they're actually going to sort of do perhaps a, a final activity where they're going to be practicing something with a bit more freedom. So we have the typical stuff such as mingles, working together. To, so mingle when you're going around and asking students for a piece of information. Maybe they're filling in a chart and they're asking for information. Working together to solve a problem. This is often called a jigsaw task. So if you can look up after this session what jigsaw tasks are, it's where student A has some information that student B needs and vice versa, and they have to work together to try and solve a problem. You've got true and false sentences. This is where they're practicing their grammar, where they have to write a couple of sentences that are true about them and a sentence that's false. 
uh, for example, I can speak French, I can um, dance salsa, and you've got to notice which one is true, which one is false. Uh, spot the difference, like we looked at in the book previously. This is always really fun. And then also this freer idea, you know, designing uh, a chart to display their knowledge. Uh, so, for example, instead of a grammar table, maybe they're making a chart for you, uh, a poster where they're using the language to maybe sell something. They can uh, design a rap or a tweeting conversation, anything really. The output can be so creative and it can also be um, chosen by the students as long as you give clear rules, time limit and the fact that you have to use this grammar in your um, production, you can do whatever you like um, as long as they run it past you. And this idea of role play, I love role plays in class. And I've just got one here from the book um, which I particularly enjoyed. The, the grammar structure here was to say, uh, why don't we for suggestions? And so it says here in activity seven, read the comments and suggestions uh, and write suggestions using activities that they um, looked at in their vocabulary word box. And so it says, I love swimming and looking at the animals in the sea. Why don't you go snorkeling? And then activity eight is act out the dialogues from exercise seven in pairs. Ah, oh, okay, but why don't we push that? You know, think about usage for our grammar. Okay, when might I use this? Slide? Travel agents, why don't we pretend that we're travel agents and we have to sell uh, a dream holiday to our friend. So our friend comes along and says, okay, um, yeah, I'd like to have a holiday with you, but I don't wanna stay in a hotel. And so the partner says, oh, well, why don't you um, go camping in the mountains? Oh yeah, but I, and, and so on and so forth until the person can sell them a holiday. So again, if you're thinking about that thump, if you're thinking about that usage, it can help you to, to spark off you know, an activity that's really memorable and meaningful. So let's wrap it all up now then. So scaffolding, I think you've seen it all before, but I think now you can understand what it takes to have successful scaffolding tasks and that you need to carefully plan which of the tasks you're going to use with your students so that they're engaged and that they're effective. And the idea behind scaffolding is that you're there and their friends are there, especially at the very beginning of the year to provide a lot of support, but then you're actually gonna step back and be just perhaps the guide or the consultant in the lesson rather than the driver of the lesson. You're expecting your students to be a bit more autonomous and to diligently work hard. Um, have a think about your students' levels and how you're gonna challenge them. Is it beneficial for someone to have an extra layer to help them understand? Is it beneficial to take a layer away because the student already kind of knows it? So, you know, feel free to edit your course book and make it work for your students. Think about that concept of thump and thump up your lesson. Make sure your students walk away with knowing the form, the meaning, the usage and the pronunciation. Also that stir and settle dynamic that works so well, you know, get creative, stir them up, settle them down, Students are gonna love it. Um, and also I think grammar, as we've said before, a lot of students will make mistakes in grammar. That's absolutely normal and natural. So you've got to then review that grammar in future lessons, you know, as warmers or coolers or games. Um, so when students say, when you say, oh, we're gonna do some grammar today, and they, oh, I wanna play a game. So well, you did just play a game and it was grammar. So let's learn some more grammar so that you're gonna play another game with me next week. And I think my final piece of advice for everyone out there is don't give up. More often than not, you attend a training session and you go, great, I love that. I'm going to try that out with my students. And then perhaps it doesn't go quite to plan or your students didn't quite get on board. And um, it could be that, well, the students don't know what's in your brain. They don't know what you're expecting them to do. And so you need to keep at it a little bit in order for students to, to come on board with you. So don't give up after the first couple of lessons and go, ah, oh, scaffolding doesn't work, I don't like this. Keep going with it, yeah? Um, don't give up because um, as I say, students need time to adapt to this. So that's it from me. 
Uh, thank you very much for attending this session. I'm just going to encourage you also to sign up for a whole host of other fantastic webinars that are coming up with Pearson. This event goes on till the 15th of May. And um, this webinar has been recorded and within two weeks you will get a link to the recording, uh, a personalized certificate and a virtual goodie bag. And so now I'm just gonna deal with some questions that have come through, okay. So, and also thank you to those people who've been watching on Facebook, I also really appreciate it. Um, okay, so I have a question here. Is, uh, is there a specific order to teach grammar depending on students level? level? For example, first, present, simple, before future. Um, if I knew the answer to that question, I'd probably be the author of the most successful grammar books of all time. <laughs> Usually grammar is taught by um, how frequently it comes up in a in a in everyday conversation or writing so we tend to teach present simple because it is used about in 70 percent of conversation you're going to be using present simple so we tend to teach that first of all uh, rather than starting with the the third conditional okay or a mixed conditional so actually there's no set way or correct way of doing of learning grammar but it does come it is closely associated with um how frequently we use that grammar. Okay, next question. What's the difference between usage and meaning? Yeah, this is a hard one, I think, to get your head around. Okay, the, the meaning is like, what is it doing? Okay, so for example, with the present continuous, um, we use it to talk about things that are happening now. Mm -hmm. Usage is when do I actually say a present continuous sentence? In what kind of context in life will I be using present continuous in, in when I order my food from a cafe? No, I would probably be using, I would like to have a Coca-Cola, I would like to have a sandwich. I'm not going to say today I'm having a Coke, please give me one. So usage is really in real life, when am I using this grammar? And so therefore, why don't I try and ask my students to reproduce in classroom a situation where they might use it? So for example, that travel agent role play um, is, an, is an example of usage. I'm going to say, well, why don't you? I'm going to hear, why don't you if I'm going to travel agents? So meaning is, what does it do? Well, that means I can talk to you saying what I'm doing now. Usage is, what real life situation am I likely to hear this grammar? Okay, any other questions? Yes, one more. What kind of books do you recommend for advanced level students, especially students who want to get an IELTS score? Oh, there's a whole host of books. Pearson does a good uh, range of books for advanced students and they also do some, some, some good um, activity books and online web stuff. But apart from that, I think that for advanced students, sometimes real life uh, stuff really helps them. So TED Talks, um, going online and looking at you know news articles. And because it's teenagers, perhaps more like magazines or even um, cartoon based um, stuff. Like, uh, you know, there's some students that like manga stories and that can contain some quite um, advanced grammar. I think that asking your students perhaps what they're interested in and working from there would be a good start. But I don't have anything uh, particularly concrete that I'll recommend to you. OK, and another question. Can you name a couple of online tools we can use in grammar teaching? Uh, the GSE t uh, Teacher Toolkit would be one that I would recommend. Uh, and there's a couple of sessions coming up on Pearson of how to use that toolkit as well. Um, and I think that um, with grammar, I think if you go to a regular search engine and type in what type of grammar you're looking for, plus activity or game, you can get a lot of good things there. There's some nice online um, resources. Oh, goodness, um, what's it called? Where you're... Um, um, playing games with the students and it flips over. Oh, I can't remember the name. It flips over the, the the card and then you can play games with remembering. Oh, I'm drawing a blank right now. I'm so sorry. But I think to go back to my original thing, if you're teaching present continuous and you want to have some interesting games or activities or online tools to practice, go to your search engine, type in present continuous, fun activities, and there's loads of things that will hit you there. Okay. I'm having a look, a couple of other questions. 
Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so the stir and settle. What are the advantages of stirring and settling? Okay, so imagine if you're giving your students um, a gap fill and then you're asking them to write something then you're giving them another gap fill or head down or reading. And it's all the time with their head down, 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 asking them to concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. This can be very monotonous and it can lead to students going, I find this really boring. Then what you want to do to counteract that and to help students to practice pronunciation, practice their speaking, is you'll want to stir them up. So heads out of the book, perhaps looking at someone and talking to them okay um so that rhythm helps students feel um, calmer weirdly enough it does so speaking from experience here if you've got a student that's got a head down and then they look up and they're having a bit of fun with a partner then they'll then more easily go and do the head next head down activity okay so that back and forth and back and forth is actually almost like a, a constant nice rhythm that you've got to your lesson. If it's too much head down, as I said, it's boring for students or perceived as boring. And if it's too much game, talk to your partner, do some pronunciation, let's have another game. It's all too much adrenaline. It's all too much um, for the senses. And students can also feel anxious and also start to misbehave, okay? So I think that having that dynamic actually creates that weird sort of level, a level class. Okay, how can we as teachers plan a good class if we have classrooms with 50 students and even students with special needs? Okay, well, well, if you're teaching that number and students with special needs, you're a very special teacher yourself, so well done for that. I think the idea of table groups will work perfectly and that idea I had about projecting answers on the board rather than having everybody, 50 of them, looking at you and waiting for answers. Um, and I think that with regards to special needs, um, there's a session with Pearson on Friday at five o'clock um, about um, the teacher toolkit and help with um, special needs. So perhaps tuning into that would really help you there. Um, but again, I think if you have table groups, team captains who are responsible for learning, freeing you to go and help others can help our students learn their grammar, okay? Um, another question, do I like to teach wrongs? Yes, I do. I often ask the students to give me a list at the beginning of the year and also as I chat to them what their favorite artists are, what their favorite songs are, and I try to find songs that they like that happen to practice the grammar that we're doing. Um, and I also personally, you have to get really, really enthusiastic with songs so that students don't go, oh, the teacher. You have to be really passionate about pronunciation or the songs that you're doing or the activities that you're doing. And then um, asking students to like do their own song. I do ask their stu my students to plan their own song and write their own lyrics, but they are well within their rights in my classroom to just make a little song and perform it on their table. They don't have to like sing it in front of everybody else. But as long as they're writing the lyrics and then like having fun with it, they can keep it in their tables. Okay, I think that's all the questions. I'm having a look at the chat box. Um, yes, it is. Thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And especially to all of you who are teaching online at the moment because of the, the current coronavirus that we have. A big thank you to you. And thank you very much for joining me. Take care. Bye-bye.